change your mind, change your money, change your life. I am Coach Rob Lee Simmons, the host of this podcast, and let me be your tour guide to greatness. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. If I was doing any better, I would be you. Welcome to the Greatness Academy podcast. I have an amazing, amazing guest. This is one of the first Muslim chaplains to be, to serve in a division, serve, you name all the stars, one star, two star, three star. We have a author. We have just a big, big, big legend in the building today, Dr. Shabazz. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm great. I'm great. I'm absolutely wonderful, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, man. So I know you're on Hawaii time. I truly appreciate your time. Hey, I want the listeners to know a little bit about you, man. Can you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I really like to start off with any show that I'm on with, with this story. And forgive me if I get a little emotional. My life started at 10 years old being molested by a family friend. Okay. Because I was molested by a family friend, that sent me into all kind of psychological turmoil. I was an extroverted kid, happy, sports guy. But then when that happened to me, I, I closed into myself. I special education in the eighth grade, failed the ninth, 10th, 12th grade, went to summer school and kind of graduated there. And because God blessed me with this humongous body, right? I'm 6'5", 275. I got to go to college and play sports, even though I was probably a functional, almost functional illiterate. So I go to college and I hadn't dealt with the trauma of the molestation because in African-American community or any community for that matter, male being traumatized like that, you don't talk about that. You just hide it because you're still trying to be a man. But I, I, because I hadn't dealt with it, honestly, and I'm not proud of this, I had to try to prove that I was a man over and over and over. So anybody that would look at me for more than three seconds, I'd just beat the hell out of them and, and try to prove that I was a man. That type of behavior got me in trouble. So at any party that I was in, people always knew I was going to fight, right? I was going to be drunk and I was going to fight. So six guys jumped me, shot me in the back, beat me with a shovel. And I almost lost my life at 21. I was airlifted out to the Tyler Medical Center where I almost died. You would think at that point, to be honest with you, an intelligent person says, hey, it's time to straighten your life, <laughs> right? right? I come back, go to the same place at the same party, pure ignorance and dysfunctionality, and I see the guy. And all I'm thinking is I need to go to my friends and we need to find out because I'm about to deal with this guy. And this is the importance of having a good friend. I always say you're the sum total of the five people I, you hang around. I go to my friends, so-called friends. These wonderful people give me a sawed-off shotgun and a 45. Eliminate that expletive, right? Yeah. I'm trying to be a man. I don't know what a man is. I didn't grow up with one in the house. They telling me, eliminate this kid. I'm thinking that's my obligation. In my humble opinion, God always sends somebody to say the right word, even though you got a long, not a wrong word. So I'm going to get emotional. This guy, Ace, told me, say, man, your mama going to be disappointed in you. You kill that kid, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. So mama is a trigger word for me. I love my mom. Rest in peace, queen. And so that night I decided, because he said that, not to kill that kid. Still in dysfunction, I took a crowbar. And I beat the hell out of him, just savage. So anyway, long story short, went to jail, expelled from school, decided to come in the military, had not dealt with the molestation. Come in the military, any authority figure that tries to discipline me, was getting into it. I jumped over the desk to the first sergeant, got a field grade, all, all that stuff. Again, God always sends somebody, and I'll conclude here, in your life, at your worst times, you can choose the lesson or not. Sergeant Major, when I was on active, on, uh, special dude said he brought me into his office, and he set me down for an hour. 
I really didn't hear what he said, but I heard four words that absolutely changed my life at 27 years old. He said, I believe in you. Mm. I believe in you. Nobody had told me my whole life that they believed in me. And so those words, brother, I got to tell you, that's why I'm sitting here today. And I promised him and I promised myself that I was going to do everything the rest of my life to make that man proud of me. And I have. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. We talk about the fact that you grew up, got to college, still was barely literate, but now having a doctorate, four masters, educating yourself to the extent that you have made a complete 360. How important was that was the education to you to break that barrier for you? In my mind, I said it took me some 25 years to destroy my life. Mm. I was going to spend the next 25 years recovering my life. And so that's why you see the two PhDs and the four master's degrees. I've been in school for 25 straight years. Mm. And I was everything I could with no excuses to ensure that I become the man that my mom, that's why I always put a son that never forgets that my mom uh, and my dad thought I could be. Those guys went through incredible racism, discrimination. They never reached their full potential. Now, here it is. All of us have children so we can get them to the next level. Here I am, wasting that opportunity, trying to be something that I'm not. And so I said to myself, honestly, brother, I'm going to spend the next 25 or the rest of the years of my life trying to be educated, trying to be an intelligent, real model to people, not a role model who is playing some role so people are like them. I come out and I'm 100% authentic every day. And those people who happen to be in my profession, they might call me arrogant, narcissistic, show off long range. And when I'm getting up posting these videos at 3.30 in the morning, I don't worry about them. That's not for me because I got thousands of people in my inbox who are saying I'm the father that they never had. Mm. They got thousands of people. I'm going to tell you a story. I was on TikTok. And this guy had a hand on his tab called Carly's dad, which means he has children. I think he has three little girls. And he saw the video when I was talking about almost killing myself and how I recovered my life. He said he was an hour away from suicide. He saw my video and he decided not to kill himself. You see, what a responsibility that 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 God has given me that we all have. To not only uplift ourselves, but to uplift other people in the world. I think we get sidetracked, brother, by allowing other people's opinions to, to inhibit our purpose. That, that's, we can't do that. If God has put something on your heart, if God has allowed you to be able to influence people, like I'm sure you are because you're on this podcast, hosting this podcast. Nobody should be able to come and tell you, hey, man, that's not really a good podcast. Why don't you shut that thing down? <laughs> you <know? laughs> right. right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, and I love how you take advantage of your, your platform. And so you have tens of thousands, or twice say 20 of thousands of followers across all platforms. How did you get started in? And then what do you think it was that kind of made you go viral or why people are drawn um, to you? I, th I think people are drawn first to authenticity, right? Mm. There's nothing pretentious about me. A, a man of my rank and my stature, colonel with all my education, I could just sit down on the couch, read some books, and when I go into work, try to sound smart. I don't have to be on social media. Last count, I had 1.3 billion views, mm. right? over a million followers just posting workout videos with little things under the bottom saying, don't quit. I think people are attracted to that because I think most of us are striving to be authentic. Second of all, most of us have these places in our lives where we don't feel good enough. We don't feel authentic enough. We feel like we're in our imposter syndrome. 
So now you have this person. In all relative terms, as we say in the hood, I done made it. Right? I made it. I don't have to be on the internet. I'm trying to reach back and show young kids and young adults, young men, young women, it don't matter what you went through. You still can make it. You, I got two Article 15s, been to jail twice, was a drunkard, suicidal ideations. I'm a Fulberg colonel with two doctorate degrees. Right. So somebody has told us that you are defined by your mistakes. I think I show people you're not defined by your mistakes. You're defined by your attitude to ensure not to, not to stay down. No, that's real. And then that just that kind of leads me to your story. Your story is really captivating, right? Alexandria, Louisiana, growing up rough, and then you didn't grow up. And then just really for context, and this is from my understanding that in the Muslim world, we, we, you believe that you were born Muslim, but you may not have been raised Muslim. So you are a reverted Muslim. And, and so in those challenges going through your time, it really is a 360 because there's so many I'm calling rules or laws in, in, in Islam that is a, a contradictory to how you grew up. So can you walk me through what it's like growing up in Louisiana and then going into your reversion and, and how you had to fit your, your lifestyle into new rules? Obviously, growing up in Louisiana, I grew up Lutheran. I was trained since I was 10 years old to become a Lutheran pastor. I went to Jarvis Christian College. I had studied Christianity all my life. I've been confirmed. And so my mom grew up, grew us up as devout Christians. And so my lifestyle was actually a religious lifestyle. We read the daily bread, all that stuff every day. We went to Sunday school and all those things. So I grew up a religious lifestyle. I was never a street kid. I was never a hood kid. Once, once I got outside of that environment, I tried, like most of us, I tried to be something that I wasn't, mm. right? Like most kids you hear in the military, oh, yeah, I was in the streets because the judge said, I go to jail, I'll come in the military. We're looking, I'm looking at them like, yeah, you saw, bro. You ain't <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> right, right. Believe that, but that's your story, I'll let you tell it. Right. I was never a street kid. However, I was lost and I was dysfunctional. And then one day, somebody convinced me to go see the movie Malcolm X. Mm. I said, yeah, okay, I'll go see it. Little Muslims on there, whatever. I go see the movie. I'm so captivated at this time by Malcolm X because he had this one life. Now he's in the cell and he is with an eighth grade education. You remember, I was mm -hmm. in special ed in eighth grade. And he studies and reads the whole dictionary. I so identify with that. Not only was he educated himself, he was a man, man. He spoke out against things he didn't believe. I ain't, Malcolm X could have been a Buddhist. I could, I'll probably be Buddhist right now. <laughs> I was attracted to the manhood principle, something that I was missing when I was growing up. We didn't have a lot of men in the church and the men who were in the church well, as we say in the hood, it was soft as tissue paper. I mean, just, so when I saw Malcolm X, I said, whoa, 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 whatever he is, I want to be. Hence the name Shabazz. Mm. When Malcolm X went to Mecca and he came back, he took on the name El Hajj Malik Shabazz. So Shabazz, I took from Malcolm X. And so part of my journey was imitating Malcolm X until I could learn to become myself. So that's that's so the Muslim lifestyle for me was I was just imitating Malcolm X and what he said, don't do I didn't do what he said, do I did. If he said don't drink, he said men don't drink, I stopped drinking. I ain't read no scripture. He said men don't fornicate, men get married. Everything Malcolm said, I did. No, and that's a blessing though. Just another one of those things that made me think about. Malcolm X's, his transition was actually going to travel and seeing other Muslims from around the world. Now, as you were getting, I believe you're getting educated to become a chaplain and you were studying across the world. How did studying across the world change your trajectory of what life should be like 
as a chaplain now serving back stateside? Again, one of the great things about catching a person's life story, you can see the whole life story and the whole transformation. So I saw Malcolm X in Harlem. I saw Malcolm X going to be Muslim. And then I see Malcolm X going to the Middle East and all of those changes. And he eventually stood up against the very thing that brought him out from what we call from death, right? Mm -hmm. On earth. I got a chance to look at all of that. And then I lived it all, right? Mm -hmm. Came from the street life, went and went to jail, educated myself, became Muslim. And then I go into the Middle East and study Arabic and all that kind of stuff, went to Mecca and all that kind of stuff. So for me, I've lived his life in, on my own terms, right? People ask, somebody asked me the other day on the podcast, he said, do you think Michael Max will be approve you in the military? Excuse my language. I said, I don't give a damn if he did or not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? One, one yeah. of the great things about Malcolm X, he was an educated man. Mm -hmm. And men don't control other men's past to life. I have children. They said, well, hey, dad, what do you think I should be? That ain't my fight. You tell me what you want to be, and I'll be your resource. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I became an imitator until I learned to become myself. And so coming into the chaplaincy, man, I tell you, Woo. I didn't come into the chaplaincy for reasons other people did because I'm so holy. And I try to be holy, but that's not why I came in. I saw a need for people like me to have access to the future me. I'm going to say that again. I saw a need for people like me to have access to the future me. Yeah. Right? So this guy that you see here is a created being, right? I created this guy to be able to help other people. I've since put 81 people through officer school, right? I've given scholarships to enlisted personnel to help them get their master's degree. Those schools that you see at the Sergeant Major Academy behind the scenes between me and you, because I was in education, we helped them put the schools at the Sergeant Major Academy because I believe that the officers were getting school at Warner College. Why didn't the sergeant, why couldn't the sergeant major get school? Seems like a discrepancy there. The second part of that is in the chaplaincy, me being the Muslim chaplain, me being the first to hit all these things, boy, it's, it's rough, right? It's just yeah. gonna imagine. I walk into my first commander's office and reach out to shake my hand. He won't shake my hand. And he says, we got, I'm sure you're a nice guy, but we got some problems with your religion and how you guys treat women. Have a nice day. He ain't talked to me for nine months. <laughs> wow. I had already been enlisted. I went to my car. I cried. I was hurt. But I said, you know what? Great lesson. Thank you, God. I'm going to focus on these soldiers. But that's why I'm here anyway. And so right in the right in the, got punched in the face. And so in the chaplain school, from that time, until now, while it's not that overt, you got to know being a Muslim ain't easy. Mm -hmm. It ain't easy. So I just I just navigate. That's why you always see me with soldiers and not necessarily with higher up people. Yeah, we would describe you as the people's champ, right? People, number one, they gravitate towards you. They gravitate towards your personality, but you are very approachable. Why do you feel like it's important to keep that window open to the people? It's super important because I was that guy who was an hour away from just giving up on myself. And the person that helped me was approachable, mm -hmm. right? He said, hey, man, stop that crying. Hold your head up. I believe in you. So who am I to not carry that same type of attitude when that guy saved my life, he saved my family, he gave me confidence. <laughs> that takes up. This guy sent me to 10 boards in a row. I ain't win none of them. I, I bet you said, man, this guy's dumber than I thought. <laughs> but what he did for me was I was growing in confidence as a man. I started caring about the board. I started studying. 
even though my friends was mocking me, excuse my lady, calling me dumb ass shit, bad ass, right? <laughs> they was mocking me. So by the time I hit that 10th board, it didn't matter how, if I won or not. Man, I was confident. I had pride. And then it just so happened, this is important to speaking in people's life, the company commander, I remember him, he said, you will make a great officer. Our mentality back in the days. Man, I ain't sending out. I'm thinking to myself, man, I ain't sending out to be no officer. Right, right. But he put the seed in my head, right? And so when he put that seed in my head, I was sitting on my track. I was a young E5, sitting on my track, just converted to Islam, and they wouldn't let me go to cry to prayer. And so, brother, I see y'all from the distance. I see the chapel. <laughs> I say, I say, at this point, I don't know if it's a God, right? If it is a God, please don't have that dude come talk to me. I can't take it. <laughs> I ain't left. He walked around with his little candy basket. I was like, oh, oh God, please. Don't have this dude come talk to me. So the chaplain comes in over, over and as God will have it, he stops to talk to me. So he's, he's saying, man. I've been hearing about you all around the battalion. I heard you're extremely uh, intelligent. I hear you're smart. I hear you can articulate yourself. Why don't you become a chaplain to help people like yourself? Mm -hmm. I ain't spoke to God. God ain't talked to me. He ain't called me. He ain't knocked on my door. That was the closest thing to a revelation that I've ever got. That, that word from that man, Christian, Caucasian American, Catholic, all the things that are different for me, came down, said that to me, and he changed my whole world. This, this is why you can't be like discriminative. You can't be prejudiced. You can't say, oh, he, can't, he ain't got nothing to say to me because he a different religion. He a different color. I, I don't believe what they believe. You don't know who God going to send the world through. Yeah, amen. That man changed my life. And I'm a chaplain today because of that. I'm an officer today because of the other guy. Yeah, that's, that is, I think it's so necessary to be open and risk. That's great because that's how the conversation started. But great to be open not only to the people, but be able to be receptive to other people as well, because you never know what direction that network would take you. So I know you talked about you're the sum of the five people in your circle. What does your circle look like? And then how have they benefit you? Yeah, my circle, and you have to shape that circle, by the way. They, they're just not going to haphazardly have your mindset. Right. Right. And so these people, like we vet people for jobs, right? We vet people for anything that we're doing. So these people, now I'll tell you, if you and I, we're working together or you and I became close friends. I would tell you right off. I say, Hey bro, it's so certain things I got to put on the table for you. Hope they're not offensive to you. I had a traumatized background. I don't like to be teased. Right. Those are some dis dysfunctional traits that come out of our neighborhood. I'll say, second of all, never be in competition with me. I want to be, I want you to be my friend. I don't want to compete with you. When I compete with you, now I'm putting you in a whole different category, mm -hmm. okay? And because competition brings out sometimes the best in us, but it brings out the worst in us because somebody got to be number one and the other person got to be number two. Mm -hmm. And so if the person is number two, me and you, our wives, we go out to dinner and you telling her how you totally decimated me in these events. Are you showing me up in front of my girl? That's a problem. Right. So I got those hard, too fast rules. The third rule for me, I will say, I say this to all my friends. If it can't evolve me, don't involve me. Right? That's good. So mo most people say, OK, Shabazz, hey, I'm sure you're a good dude. I can't do it. So I shape my circle. Right. And so I got I got a couple of people in my life who. Oh, my last one, I got, I got to tell you this. If we're friends, I don't come to you. I know this is really hard and fast in, the, in an African-American community. Oh, I'm your friend, so I'm going to tell you the truth even if you don't want to hear. No, 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 no. You don't get to speak in my life without permission. 
You're a grown man. Who I'm coming to you, telling you what I, I don't have all the facts, I mean, about you and tell you, hey man, you need to change A, B, C, and D. I think that's emotionally unintelligent. Mm -hmm. If you say, hey, I'm having this thing going on, what do you think about it? Now you've invited me in. I don't I think it's quite arrogant for people to come and tell you how you should change their life, how you should change your life, and they ain't got their stuff together. So anyway, I, I put those four things on the table, and over a period of time, some people can adhere to those. Other people can't. Don't mean I ain't going to be your friend, but you ain't going to be in my circle of trust. Absolutely. That makes sense? Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you this. What motivates you? I want, I want to provide a life for my children that they didn't have to recover from. I'm going to say that again, because I don't want your audience to miss that. I wanted to provide a life to my children that they didn't have to recover from. Okay? If you always see on my thing, I have a son that never forgets. What that means is our soldiering here in America, the African Americans, has been very difficult. Right? Whether it's education, whether it's job, discrimination, whatever it's been. And so my job as the father, the head of the family, is to show my children what courage is, what education is, what intelligence is, what resilience is. That's what motivates me. I get up every morning knowing that whether my kids put a like on there or not, they watching daddy. Right. right? They don't mildly understand the discrimination, the Islamophobia, all the stuff that I go on, because that's not important for them to understand. What's important for them to understand is to see daddy as a resilient person. Right? So when I get up every morning, I'm 55. Right? I get up every morning at 0, 0330. And I'm telling you, I bet you my kids and the rest of the world are working, watching and saying, hey, man, if this guy could get up, surely I can. And I'm going to tell you this story. And, and when I decided to be a man, I decided that I was going to be an inspirational figure. My kids used to hate me. Not because I was rough with them, but at 0500, I used to wake up in the house, rise and shine. I'm going train. Why y'all sleeping? You ain't gonna never be what you're supposed to be. My wife is like, get your crazy ass blessings out of here. <laughs> Even my daughter, she, she's 26 now. She was at the gym yesterday. You guys are five hours ahead. So it was like 3.45 in the morning. She called and I'm thinking something wrong. She said, whoa, I'm training while you sleeping over there. I'm like, right? You instill that type of excitement in them for life. And so for me, that's so important to be that type of role model or real model for my children. So that's what motivates me. Yeah, that's amazing. One of the things that I really want to talk about, just to get the stigma out of the way, right? How important is your wife to your family? At the promotion ceremony I had about five years ago, where I took over the division, I said that my wife is the gristle in my back dog. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. the gristle actually holds the backbone together nobody sees when i come home and i'm crying because of the overwhelming discrimination that i get didn't necessarily get the best jobs even though i was out front getting after more education just love for soldiers and the love for the army sometimes didn't get to invited to the important meetings Sometimes don't get to shake their hand. No time I'm more invited over people's houses to eat dinner with them, right? And so my wife has to see the soft tears that go down my eyes. And she is there to say, hey, you're going to be fine. Keep doing God's work. The second part that's important about that, because I don't even show her that side all the time. Because it's it's it could be dangerous. Yeah, yeah. She still 
don't want to see that, that type of weakness all the time. So I don't show her that all the time. But sometimes it just get overwhelming. The second part of that is my wife has knows how to be, how to speak to me. And you also have to shape that. When we first got together, she was like, God, dog, can you take out the trash? So I don't have to tell her. I got, I said, hey, listen. If you tell me to take a 10-pound bag of shiznick out and you screaming at me, I don't care if the whole house fills up with it and I'm not taking it out. But I said, as a woman, you could come and kiss me on my cheek and say, baby, I would really appreciate it if you take out that trash. I'm going to jump up. I'm going to take out that trash and I'm going to come back looking for your approval. Right? When she... Learn to do that. That's when I took off because yeah. I didn't have to deal with that at work and then come home and deal with that monster at home. So she learned how to talk to me. So that yeah, she's everything. She's in Texas right now. This is how important she is to my family. This is my third. We made a pact that we, I would never go to a duty station by myself. Hmm. Right? She is so important to my family that my kids, all my kids and all my grandkids are there in Texas. I say, sweetheart, I'm fine. I'm good. I ain't going to get caught in no scandals. You can stay there. They, I had to be careful with this. They need you more than me. They need you. They, they need mama. I'm good. That's how important she is to our family. Yeah, and I want to definitely put that in the air. I know that in Islam, they have the uh, people who don't know have a, a stigmatism of how Muslims treat women. But the fact of the matter is the wife is more than the backbone of the family. Oh, and oh yeah. It's important, important to know. Yeah, people are really uneducated about that. <laughs> I said this at a lecture in London and people were amazed. But if you actually study the Quran, you would think it's written by a woman. All mm. of these rights that you see that women have after day, women's suffrage movement, the in the in the Islamic home, right? I pay for everything. Mandated by a Muslim man. My wife makes some art eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year. I don't know what she does with it. Because it's mandated as a Muslim man, I pay for that. I, it's a funny story that because I was Muslim for seven years before she was. And I try to drop some seeds on her. I say, in Islam, when you become a Muslim, the Muslim man pays for everything. And your paycheck is your paycheck. She say, let me read that. I let her read it. She said, oh, I'm Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> no question. <laughs> I like that rule. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's good. Let me ask you this. This is the fun stuff, right? We get into a lot of your TikTok videos. Most of them motivational. All of them are motivational. But what's your max in the bench, man? 450. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> that is insane. That's insane. And that especially not only just at your age, but as military style, you don't have to do that but these right. are the things that you do for yourself and that is truly motivating how do you get people to understand how important fitness is to everything else that it is that they want to do and accomplish for me whether like religion or fitness i'm not an imposer i'm a doer right mm -hmm. i never even talked to my wife really about islam she just see me praying and reading the Quran and she saw the change that it made in me. And so people want a bit of something that has light. As you said, I'm 55 years old. I started lifting weights at 51, right? Off a challenge. I was doing about 180 on the bench and I'm a, I've always been a big guy. So I'm in the gym and I had some just finished running because that's the officers. That's all we do. Can't do no push ups and sit ups. So I'm just running six miles a day, sometimes 10 miles a day. But I'm in the gym and I got some 20s and I'm just playing around. And these people are crying. They laughing like a big old dude like you 
only lifting 20 pounds. I mean, they literally in tears, not figuratively. Just like anybody else, I'm competitive and petty. They call me petty <laughs> the bill. <laughs> so I said to myself, I am going to lift, I'm going to bench press every day until I get 405 pounds and I'm going to send them the video. Mm. <laughs> mm. So last year, last September 22nd, 20th to 2020, 20, yeah, 2023, I finally got it. And so I sent them the video. But again, inside of that, using that anger, not at them, but what they were saying, it propelled me to start putting all that stuff on video. I think that translates to people. Not think people hit me in the video in the inbox all the time. Well, you're inspirational. Where do you get the motivation to do that? And I always tell them what I just told you in some of the other stories. Army speak, okay? Not disparaging anybody. But chaplains are not necessarily known for that. And so for me, as a chaplain, as a motivator, as a people, as a person who wants people to come to me so I can give them resources, I was thinking about strategies to ensure that I can get soldiers to know that I was approachable so they can come and talk to me so I can help them. And so that's the whole, that's where the whole gym thing came up from. And so putting that stuff on video every morning with a, you know, a sprinkle of the Bible here, a sprinkle of the crime here, the motivational quotes. I got more soldiers in my inbox and I, I spent all day answering them. And so that's where that came from. It wasn't necessarily super healthy, super fit, because I eat Popeye six days a week, by the way. So <laughs> I'm not necessarily a healthy guy, but I, I'm a disciplined person because I want to help people. Yeah, that's uh that's powerful, man. That's powerful. They they say you seen it. No one man should have all that power. What is your superpower and how do you use it? And my superpower is being able to connect to anybody, right? Uh I my wife has often said you can make friends with a light pole. And it's true. So I'm in this hotel, obviously I ain't got housing yet. So you're here like 10 days at a time. And you got, I got to transfer to somewhere else because it's got this big, it's called Rempack. So it's got like 100,000 extra people here. So they have no room really available. So every five, six days, you got to move. So I'm just being myself. Every time I go downstairs to go to the gym or when I come back, I speak to the people at, at the desk, sit there and talk to them for about two minutes. So God is my witness. Yesterday is my day to check out and I had to move at 11 o'clock. The phone rings and the lady says, Mr. Shabazz, I talked to the manager and he's going to let you stay here till August 6th and you don't have to move. Right? Treating human beings with dignity and respect no matter what their occupation is. Because what most people don't know is, and I, I thank God for all my troubles, when I got... Uh, kicked out of college, I had to go to Kmart. I was a janitor. Mm. So I know how people looked at me. I I had, I was one semester away from having a college degree, but because I was a janitor, people just looked at me with total disdain, disrespect, and looked at me as a worthless human being. And I said, I would never do that to people. So that's my superpower. Yeah. This is in the PBS documentary. I had a young man outside. I had just exploded on the internet, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and all this kind of stuff. So there's a young man outside of my office doing extra duty. PFC, white kid, white Caucasian American, and he got his head down. I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, hey, man, what's going on? How you doing? And he busts out crying. Why would a guy like you speak to me? I ain't nobody. So he crying. I'm crying. And I said, put the freaking broom down. He comes in the office. We talk for three hours. Great thing about being the chaplain. I, I make my own sketch, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talk for three hours. And every minute, the kid was just sitting up more and more in the chair. I was giving him life. One of, one of my philosophies is after you talk to me, you'll be stronger than you left. 
That's my philosophy. So the kid sitting up straight, and next thing he knows, he says, how can I be like you? I say, hey, let's make it happen. The kid is a captain today in the United States Army. I love it. I love it. Speak life into people, man. Mm -hmm. I could have just walked rolled by. I'm a big colonel and full bird. Hey, hey, take that trash with me, okay? <laughs> that, that's how people treat you, though. Mm -hmm. He's a human being. That's somebody's kid. I got a saying. You can steal it if you like. No, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, it's, I say, if you want to know if you're a good leader, pray that God give your, your children a leader like you. I'm going to say that again. If you want to know if you're a good leader, pray to God that he gives your children a leader like you. I bet you 95% of the people will never make that prayer. Because when it's time to stand up, when it's time to fight for somebody, when it's time for to put everything on the line for somebody who nobody cares about, 99% of the people won't do it. Yeah. And they're always talking about their leaders. I got a young man, I won't share his name, just left St. Carl, being court-martialed. And he came down there and he says, A, B, C, and D, nobody to talk to me, da, da, da. I said, well, why are you here? They said you would talk to me because you talked to anybody. In a letter of character for him because I had been talking to him about six months and the kid is crying. Why would you write me a letter of character? You're going to ruin your reputation. I said, the only reputation I have is with God, buddy. I don't care who thinks what. I'm going to stand up and do what's right. And that's what, I, that's what I've been doing for 33 years, bro. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Over time, I learned that your alignment is your assignment and all God always gives you an assignment. What do you think that assignment is? And then how are you executing it? And my, my assignment is clear. It is to uplift human beings. I have a saying that said, I inspire until I expire. My job is to come into your life. If you will allow me and make you stronger than you were going out. That does include that doesn't include who you are, what you believe, how you look, or who you're sleeping with. That ain't got nothing to do with me. I don't have those barriers that other people have. You walk in my office, you honor me by allowing me to talk to you. Now, let's get you to where you want to go or to a place that you don't even know that you had the confidence to get. I'll stay in your life. Until we get you where you are. That's my assignment. And I'm very clear on that. I have been told at least 58 times to get off the internet. You're a colonel. You're an imam. You're a professor in the university. It is uncouth. They use the big word on me. It's uncouth. <laughs> For you to be on the internet. <laughs> I said... Oh, important person. I always got to say important people because I don't want to give away their rank. I say important person. No disrespect. I said, I am 100% submissive to you and your leadership, but I cannot give up helping other human beings when I was about to kill myself and somebody helped me. I said, I can't do that. I'm not doing that. I said, it's nothing. I've been on the internet for 14 years. Not one complaint. No EO violations, no IG violations, no sexual indirect, none of that. So I said, I'm, I said, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just putting some folks on and throwing it up 405, no spider, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We say one million viewers later, one million yeah. followers later, one billion viewers later. Um right. still stand here strong. And I truly, truly, I just admire not only just your personality, but your ability to give and pour into others. Um, Thank you. Before we close out, what was one thing that you would want to leave with the viewers that may enhance their day or change their life? There's a couple of quotes I want to leave with you. You know, when I walked into the education center, and when I wanted to restart my education, I saw a quote that I made mine. It said, most people die at 25 but they're not buried into the 75. And so I, I said, I said, 
Sir, what does that mean? I don't know. He said, figure it out. So I left there and probably for the next five, six days of just looking at this quote. And so for me, what it meant, and you guys could do with it what you want. Most of us buy into false narratives. You get to be 25, 30. You say, oh, I can't dream no more. I got a house. I got a car. I got these responsibilities. So I'm going to put my dreams on hold and let my kids get the dream. That's what's called the generational curse, by the way. So you're not waiting till you're 75 for somebody to throw the dirt on you. And you live a whole life of regret. And so most people that died at 25, they're not buried into that 75. I say to you and to anybody who's listening, do not buy into that. Your dreams can be realized, even with a family, even with responsibilities. And I wanted to show that, not by talking, but by my life. I, all of that stuff that I did, that I currently, you see on my bio, I did that after 30. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. After 30. Ain't that crazy? Yeah. But I used the strategy family. I was a, I'm still a big sports guy. But I said, I'm watching Saints games or I'm in love with LeBron James. I said, these guys leaving multi-millions to their children. And I'm watching the whole game of LeBron James. No, sir. I'm going to watch the fourth quarter. But that so that first three quarters, I'm gonna be doing my homework. I'm gonna be reading a book, and then I watch the fourth quarter so I can talk about that at work because that's just social skills. If you're talking about that, but I refuse to watch a whole four quarters of a game and then watch Sports Center. What happened for that next two or three iterations? Most of us waste at least seven hours a day. So people ask me all the time, how did you accomplish all that? I just took three of those hours back and said, I'm going to dedicate these three hours to my life. And those three hours have turned out to that big, long bio that you see where everybody says it's impossible. No way he could have did that. I just took those. I just took three of those seven hours back. And it happened. So the second quote I want to give you is until you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at will never change. I'm going to say it again, and then I'll be in my last quote. Until you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at will never change. you got to change your perspective. you, you got to change your perspective on what success is for you, not what people want for you, what success is for you, and then how you go about getting that. You and I talked about people. We, we can't cut certain people out because they don't look like us. We can't cut certain people out because they don't think like us, right? You can't cut certain people out because they don't have the presentation that you like. When you change your perspective, anybody can give you knowledge. You take that knowledge and you do what you will with your life, right? Lastly, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. I usually got to say this five times, but people don't get it. If you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. You cannot change people who are dysfunctional in your life, who are, who are negative in your life, who don't want to be in your life, who constantly couldn't put you down. If you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. I'm not saying you got to cut them off. But they shouldn't be in your circle, going back to that circle, too many times to affect your behavior. Too many times to affect your behavior. And so for me, those three quotes I live by. And those, those shape who I am as a person. And lastly, if you allow me. Please, sir. Isn't it amazing that all these military places, all these jobs that you are on, they have a SOP or personal philosophy of the organization, right? 99.9% .9 of people in this world don't have a personal philosophy. If you don't have one, you should develop one because it guides you. But when I was 34, I, I designed my own personal philosophy. 
and it's the four eyes, right? They're, they're, they're interchangeable. I as in letter, which is me, and I as in what I see inside. Interdict mediocrity, intercept ignorance, infuse excellence, and this is my favorite, influenced by many, defined by none. Interdict mediocrity. I will do my best in everything that I'm in, even if I ain't totally sold on it. Right? But if my name is on it, I'm doing my best. Intercept ignorance. You, nobody in this world can tell me what I can't do. That's ignorant. I'm going to intercept that ignorance up all, every day, all day. Infuse excellence. This is important because we too busy looking to the right and the left, comparing ourselves to people. I'm going infu to infuse excellence, the best that I can do. And I'm not going to look to the left and say, oh, my God, he's better than me. I'm not going to look to the right and say he's smarter than me. I did the best that I could do. That's 100%. This is the one I like most because I have a lot of people influence me like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King, Mandela. I'm none of them. I'm influenced by but I'm not them. I'm influenced by them. I took what some of the stuff they gave me, but I'm Khalid Shabazz and I'm going to do it my way. All of those people who are my heroes. If they were probably in my life right now, they'd probably give me to try to change my life because they want me to do it like they want me to do it. And I would tell them respectfully, this ain't your life. So influenced by many, defined by none. Let me shut up. I'm the imam, so I talk all day. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Free game. And so this is one of the things, man, my podcast, I just love sitting back, listening. I invite the goats on. I let the goats give me all of the knowledge. Man, this is free coaching for me, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hey, yeah. if I get somebody else in your stature, I might got to pay $100 an hour. I'm going to take this free coaching. I love it, man. <laughs> Where can the people find you? How they get a hold of you? Yeah, they, they listen, I'm on everything except Snapchat. So I'm on LinkedIn. I got about five grand, no, 6,000 followers over there. I've got Twitter or X, whatever it's called now. I'm on the other one, Facebook. Just type in my name, call it Shabazz. And you'll get all my hands. I'm on everything. I love it. I want it. Yeah. YouTube, all that stuff. On all that. My job is to give people access. Yeah. To me. Yeah. That's amazing, man. And so on the show, we say change your mind, change your money, change your life. And we truly appreciate you for doing that for our, our guest today. I, I really appreciate it, brother. Thank you for having me. All right. We are over and out. Thank you for joining the podcast. And remember, Change your mind, change your money, change your life. We out.